in the graveyard shift. People sleeping away, tired, bored. So I have to work with, with, with that. I want to seek your permission to stand upon the protocols already established, but I also want to recognize my cabinet colleague, the Honorable uh, Vikram Bharat, Minister of Natural Resources. And I'm sure that the President would have done it already, but I want to add my voice in expressing congratulations to the organizers of this event. It is a very timely one. And to thank you for participating in such large numbers. Now, I am aware that a lot of ground would have already been covered. But I also recognize that there are a lot of grounds to be covered. The topic or the focus of this symposium is local content. And I have been asked to speak about the regulatory framework. So obviously, the local content legislation will be the focal point of my presentation. However, the legislation and the legislative framework in relation to the sector, as you would expect, is much wider. There is a, a direct regulatory statutory framework, and then there is an indirect one. And Time permitting, I hope that I can deal with both. But if I can deal quickly with the indirect one, so that you are focused on, on, on how broad the regulatory framework is. So spinning off of the oil and gas sector is our hospitality sector, which we have seen nearly eight to 10 international five-star brand, uh, five brand hotels under construction. A virtual explosion in the real estate sector, rental of properties, sale of properties, etc. Now, no one can dispute that there is a direct nexus between that expansion in those economic activities and the oil and gas sector. As a result, we have had to promulgate a condominium act, for example. We have had to promulgate a single window building process act and infrastructure to go with the act so that you can get your building permission expedited. You submit all the documents at one single window at CHNPA. And there's a machinery that grants all the other permissions which are required by law, which would include the approval of your plan from the Mayan City Council, your fire department approval, environmental approval if you require one, public health approval, and a whole host of other approvals. And we put in the law that once your Documents are all submitted. It is taken through that process. And at each step of the process, a time frame is given to the processor. So if it is the EPA, there is a time frame given to the EPA. And if they do not process your instrument or your application, or they do not communicate to you to tell you that it is deficient and ask you to fix it, then the law presumes that, or deems that permission granted. So you don't suffer the bureaucratic delay. In fact, you benefit from it. We have had to implement real estate legislation to regulate our real estate environment because you now have major operators from North America, etc., operating here. We have had to adjust, expand, and amend, modify, and modernize our 
anti-money laundering, countering the financing of terrorism legislative landscape because of the exponential economic and financial activities taking place. We are working on a new company act on insolvency legislation on the, the, to address some of the difficulties that you have in getting financing from the bank using your multi-billion dollar contracts. There is a view here that there is some law that precludes the bank from granting loans on contracts. There is no such view, there is no such law, but we are going to correct it in terms of clarifying the position so that you can able to get financing using your commercial instruments, including contracts, as collateral security. And I can go on and on to tell you the regulatory framework that we have to expand and we are expanding and overhauling all indirectly related to the sector. But that is not really what I've been invited to speak on. I've been invited to speak on local content and the sector itself. So I have listened to <clears throat> a lot of comments and commentary being made on local content. And, and, and there is a lot of clarification which I hope I can, there is a, there's room for clarification, and I hope that I can offer that clarification. So perhaps, let us start with the fact that this is a brand new sector, as have been recognized and acknowledged by several presenters, and it moved from discovery to production with tremendous alacrity, not really giving a real and serious opportunity to prepare for production. Then you had a change of government from discovery to production. And then you had the intervening 2016 PSA and all the problems associated with that PSA. And then you had virtually nothing being done from 2016 when production really began in 2017 to 2020. So really in 2020 is when efforts were expended in preparing Guyana for a sector that would have already begun production nearly four years prior. So those are the given realities that we can't quarrel about. Those were the existing factual back backdrop that you, we had to operate under. We know the realities of the oil and gas sector. It's an oil, uh, old sector, but new in Guyana. It is highly specialized and highly sophisticated. The sector by itself has built up its own, and I say this in the most benevolent way, its own cartelism. It, it has developed that by the very nature of the industry. So when one huge oil company moves or moves into production, it has, many of you would have attended a Hindu wedding. There is something called a bharyat. It has a whole jamaat that comes with it. Now, we recognize very early, in fact, we recognize when we were in the opposition, that unless we take a formative action, then Guyanese would become ostracized from this sector. For many reasons. One, the cartelism, which I speak about. And of course, that has its own benefits to the oil operators, 
they are familiar with these companies these companies have decades of experience experiences they would have had institutional relationships with them they would have had proven track record of competence in the various endeavors so there is great comfort expediency and obviously efficiency if these companies move together and, and you one can fault the oil companies for um, situating themselves in such an environment so we had to recognize that then also recognize the reality that it's a new sector in a country that is already suffering from human resource shortages on the population that is compounded by the fact that it's a new industry where you have very little if any residual training in your demographics in your population therefore if a formative action is not taken in the most effective way then the ostracization to which I made reference would have happened and you would have had a deeply divided society which has happened in other countries and that indeed is part of the resource course that we are we keep hearing about that's one component of it many countries have used policies not law we felt that the policies would have been ineffective we needed the strongest institutional instrument to ensure that the Guyanese workforce would be protected and would be offered a fair and reasonable opportunity to participate in the sector. And that is how we began to conceive the idea of a local content legislation to protect Guyanese patronage and to protect, rather to secure a place for your not mere participation but a dominant participation in the sector because we have no apologies for saying that our priority is to ensure that Guy Guyanese dominate the sector that is why we have a law called a local content law because that is the ultimate objective but we have to travel a road to get there and I'll speak about that journey that we have to embark upon which we have done which we have started but it's a work in progress so we started a, a series of consultation we appointed a large team and they held consultations for nearly two years many of you would have participated in the consultations and they brought a broad uh, regime of recommendations then we began to look across the globe for legislative models to use we consulted Ghana Nigeria Uganda Norway we looked at a policy that Trinidad and Tobago implemented policy not law and we called from these various statutory instruments to create what we believe would be a legislative model that satisfies at least preliminarily the peculiarities 
and idiosyncrasies of an emerging oil and gas sector in Guyana to protect Guyanese employment and investments. And I want to recognize the efforts of some of these young men, uh, Michael Monroe, Bobby Gosai, Michael Pertab, and a bunch of young Guyanese. Ms. Sargent from the AG office. And we, we were dealing with a brand new thing. We, we only had to, you, you were only allowed to cut and paste a couple of provisions because these countries were difficult from Guyana. They were vast countries. You had great human resource capital. These, none of them were as new in the sector as we were. So there were different realities that we couldn't borrow from. So we had to design and conceive for ourselves. We held many rungs of consultations because everybody wants to participate, and rightfully so, in the sector. And every sector believes that they can meet the 100% demand in the sector. So the insurance, believe, insurance sector, for example, believes that they can meet the 100% insurance demands. The lawyers were offended because I told them that I don't think that they can meet the legal demands of the sector. They were very offended. They wrote a press statement blistering me. And perhaps rightfully so, I, they are a very educated class of people. Then you had various, so everybody want to say that, or everybody said in the various rounds of consultation, that their peculiar particular sector can meet the demands. But at a policy level, you know differently. You know differently. You know that this is a multi-billion dollar sector, multi-billion US dollar sector. You know that you are dealing with a population that is highly untrained, a commercial environment that is unsophisticated having regard to the demands of this sector. You're talking about capital that you put all the banks together in Guyana, they can't produce the type of working capital that is required. You know that. So we had to make policy decisions, but we did it in consultation. And we created a sliding schedule. And we made a distinction in the schedule between what is available locally. So local legal service, for example, and I'll go to the schedule. 90% must be Guyanese. Local insurance company, 90% Guyanese. Road transportation, for example, 100% Guyanese. Because why we can't buy all the trucks that are required? So, and I'll get to the sliding scale to show you how the various things were arrived, various policy positions were arrived at. Then, you had to determine the vexed question of who is a Guyanese, not in terms of the human being, because that is already defined by our constitution. But what is a Guyanese company for the purpose of the act? We were obviously conscious of the rent a Guyanese concept. We knew that people will fabricate relationships to meet the requirements. We know as unpatriotic and unnationalistic as I think it is, because I said so at the public consultations, you will have Guyanese who will allow themselves to be fronted for an investor in order to satisfy the act superficially. So you had to deal with that reality. 
But I think that to understand the philosophy of the, lo the philosophy that informed our local content policy is to read what the Act provides and states as its long title. Now, it is important that we read the laws that are relevant to us. I just redesigned, well, not me. I caused the website of the Legal Affairs Ministry to be redesigned, remodeled, and rebuilt so that you have easy access to it, in particular, the laws, the laws of Guyana. You have to read that. Because we try in modern time to write the law in a language that is simple, that is clear, and that is capable of comprehension by any person, not necessarily lawyers. There was a drafting style decades ago that I believe used to be deliberately coded so that only lawyers can read the thing. We have dismantled that practice. And if you read this document, it is expressed, and all the other legislation that we are doing now, they are expressed in very simple and clear language. So I will share with you the objectives and the philosophical underpinnings of the Local Content Act. And that is what in, should inform your understanding of the concept which the Act seeks to capture and promote. It's an act to provide for the implementation of local content obligations on persons engaged in petroleum operations or related activities in the petroleum sector to prioritize Guyanese nationals. Remember I spoke about prioritize, prioritize Guyanese nationals and Guyanese companies in the procurement of goods and services for the enhancement of the value chain of the petroleum sector. To enable local capacity development, to provide for the investigation, supervision, coordination, monitoring, and evaluation of, and participation in local content in Guyana. To promote competitiveness and encourage the creation of related industries that will sustain the social and economic development of Guyana and for other related matters. This that I have just read to you, holistically, but yet succinctly, captures the philosophy and the guiding principles and objectives that underpin what we are here to discuss and interrogate local content. So if ever you want to understand the ambit, to understand the priority, to understand the focus, go back to the legislation. So as I said, Guyanese, the term Guyanese is already defined in our constitution, our supreme law, and in the Guyana Citizenship Act. So they, there is no need to recraft a definition for the purpose of this act. In fact, as I said, we consulted widely. We received a recommendation from the joint opposition the parliamentary opposition, which recommended that we limit the definition of Guyanese to Guyanese living in Guyana. In other words, to 
extricate from the application of this act Guyanese in the diaspora. And obviously, we rejected that. We rejected that as a matter of policy because we believe that every Guyanese should benefit from this sector. Wherever he or she is located or situated or living. But so that's a, that's a philosophical level of the rejection. But constitutionally, it would have run afoul of the Constitution because it would have been discriminatory. Because Guyanese in the Constitution is defined by, as a person, a Guyanese citizen, 18 years and over. Born in Guyana or having acquired citizenship under the Citizenship Act by one of the mechanisms outlined. On what basis? There is no residency requirement. And I feel they're talking about the voters list, but not the voters list, we're speaking about this. The same principle applies. All right? So, so you had that feeling out there. And then you must have heard, and let me deal with these things frontally. They told us that if we implement this law, that we will violate the Treaty of Shagaramas. That we will defeat the purpose of CSME. And I said to them, our constitution, first of all, the Treaty of Shagaramas provides that if, if your laws are inconsistent, then it violates the treaty and it is illegal. But if your constitution authorizes that law or justifies that law, then the constitution shall prevail over the treaty. Our constitution, Article 9, says that sovereignty belongs to Guyanese. This Guyana is a sovereign territory. That's why we say what Venezuela is doing is affecting our sovereignty. And that sovereignty, meaning the sovereign territory of Guyana, belongs to Guyanese. All the resources of that sovereign territory belong to Guyanese. And we have a, if we own it, we have a duty to enjoy it. And if you recall, when Prime Minister Motley came here, I believe, last year, to speak at the oil and gas conference, she said exactly that. That Guyanese, like every other citizens of every country across the globe, have a right to enjoy and exploit their God-given resources. And it is on that basis that we proceeded with the act and I, we did a legal opinion to keep it in the event that anyone decides that they will challenge the act. So I move now to Guyanese companies and I want you to listen to me carefully because I only heard, maybe I have missed it, but I heard only about one part of the definition of Guyanese company. So any company incorporated under the Companies Act, which is beneficially owned by Guyanese nationals, so beneficially owned, not superficially. Beneficially means you are the real owner. You're not holding anything on trust for somebody because if we find you doing that, there's a criminal offense. That's why the term beneficially is, you beneficially own it means you actually own it. You don't have a secret document where you transfer it back somewhere. Because this is a serious offense also under the anti-money laundering regime of laws. So, which is beneficially owned by Guyanese nationals 
who ultimately, and I want you to bear these words in mind, ultimately exercise individual, individually or jointly voting rights representing at least 51% of the total issued shares of the company. So I keep, I mean, we are, you're speaking loosely, obviously, when you say 51% of the shares. But that is a very superficial interpretation to put to it. It's not merely 51% of the shares. You have to be beneficially the owner of the shares. And you ultimately, you must have the 51% of the voting rights. It's not an artificial ownership. You must control the voting rights of the company. So that's the first point I want to clarify in terms of the definition. This is the other part. You see, a lot of thought went into this thing to ensure that you, you get the protection that we would like you to get. Continues, the second ingredient it must, that has the company that has Guyanese nationals holding at least 75% of the executive and senior management position and at least 90% of the non-managerial and other positions. You understand what we are doing here? Not only you must own it effectively in terms of share and voting rights, but you must actually be managing it. 75% of the executive and senior management must be Guyanese. And 90% of the non-managerial and other position. This is a fairly rigid framework and set of criteria that you have to satisfy. You really have to commit fraud to penetrate this. It would be clear fraud and in clear violation of the act if you're going to have a relationship that is not reflective of the intent and language that this act is expressed in. So, the act also, as I said, it proceeds on, a, on the assumption, well, not an assumption, on the, the real, realistic hypothesis that we have limited human resource, resources and limited services available locally for the sector. You can't shut the sector down. So that is why the entire act is based upon an elastic principle. We are going to build as we go along. And that is why the scale, the annex, where the services are listed and the percentage are given, it's a sliding scale. And we said at periodic interval, not only we, will we, re, uh, will we um, amend the act itself, but this, sale, this scale, we made it as part of a schedule which can be amended by the minister by order, so you don't have to go back to parliament and go through that long process. It can be done by order. In the act, it has a series of provisions which require the licensee, the operators, to submit local content plans for a given period, three years, I think, and then there's a five year, where they have to demonstrate to the minister and to an oversight board what plans they have in place 
to ensure the realization of the objective of the act. That is to make Guyanese qualify, to train Guyanese as the industry progresses. They have to submit a plan to the minister. That's why the act took a year before it became operational to allow, because we couldn't disrupt the existing status quo because the, the industry was running. And the act now creates imperatives and obligations. So we, oh, one minute remaining, sorry. So we have a local content plan or a scheme in the act that allows for training by the oil companies and by the government so that there is a continuous um, priority being accorded to training. And then at a policy level, the government has complemented this by other measures. For example, you all are aware of the, um, the Oil and Gas Training Institute. You are, you are aware of the Gold Scholarship Program and a large part of that program is dedicated to offering scholarships and training for the oil and gas sector. Then at the University of Guyana level, we have, start, we have discussed with, with, with the University of Guyana and there's a whole new area of the syllabus to focus in this direction. Then we have the, of course, the local content secretariat that continues to monitor and we have said, and we said this from the beginning, that after a period, we will look at the data collected from the local content um, secretariat, speak to you, the operators in the sector, both the foreign operators and local, and then we'll come back to the drawing board to make the revision of the act. And it's not going to be a one-off event. We'll have to revise it at another stage. It's an evolving process. And we said from the beginning that it is our first try. It is a novel concept. It has never been done in this part of the world. We said that we would make mistakes. We said that it may turn out to be inadequate, and perhaps it has, but it is a solid start. And based upon what I have seen here today, and based upon the statistics generated by the, uh, the, the local content secretariat, it has been a tremendous success. As I said, it's a good foundation for us to build on, but I believe that we have done well so far in what we have achieved. Thank you very much, and of course, I will answer whatever questions you wish.